Okay, well, we have a bunch of people. Um, so why don't we get going? Um, Elliot, yes, please. Um, please feel free to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat. I think that's a great idea. Thanks for um, bringing that up. Um, cool. So I think I'm going to dive in. Um, so just one more time. I know I've said this a bunch of times already. Apologies. But this is our first time doing the Zoom webinar. Uh, feel free to use the chat and the Q&A um, if you uh, want to say something. This is a not a huge group of people, so we're welcome. Everyone is welcome to talk, um, but we do have to enable that. Um, just by the way, I enabled these security features since I was blasting out this link um, to the whole internet. So I wanted to make sure we weren't going to be Zoom bombed here. Um, anyway, so welcome to the first ever Gym Five Developer Meeting. Um, Thank you for attending. Uh, let me see if I can get my slides going here. So um, real quick, what is this meeting? Um, I'm hoping to have a monthly meeting uh, so that the Gym 5 developers, the people who are working day to day or week to week on Gym 5 can have a way to sync um, in a lower latency way than what we're currently doing on the mailing lists or on um, GitHub. So we're recording this um, and if you all think that it's a good idea, we would be happy to post this publicly um, on YouTube or via link. I'm not sure if that's useful or not, so let me know what you think. Um, we are hopefully getting a transcript automatically from Zoom, and we will use that transcript to make some notes, and we will post those publicly. Um, if you have an idea of where you would expect to see that, let me know. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards just putting it up on the website somewhere. Um, that we could also create a separate repo um, in our GitHub area for these kinds of meetings. So why are we starting to do this? Well, um, there's kind of two things going on um, that made me want to start having these meetings. One is that we're having a lot of new contributors and new developers that are joining uh, the project. Um, and this is for a couple of reasons. One, I think the transition to GitHub has made things a little bit easier for people to join and start developing, which is great. I'm really excited about that. Um, and two, there's been a lot of investment, um, especially from the NSF here in the US in Gem5. And so we're gonna start seeing a lot more developers uh, coming in and uh, trying to improve Gem5 in lots of ways. And the goal of this meeting um, beyond just, you know, improving our synchronization and trying to get things done is to grow the community. So I want to make sure that like my goal is very much transparency in this community, which we haven't done a great job of in the past. Um, and so having these conversations publicly um, is something that I hope will encourage the uh, community to grow. Please bug me if you have any questions and Bobby or Ivana um, interrupt me if I don't see them. Okay, so quick agenda. Um, so unfortunately, this first meeting, I think it's going to be a lot of me broadcasting information, um, which I hope is not what these meetings are generally. Um, I hope in the future we can have more back and forth in these meetings. Um, but since this is our first one, I imagine there's going to be a lot of broadcasting from me to you all. So first, we'll do a few introductions. Then I'm going to talk about the status of the project um, and then some updates on transitions to GitHub workflows. Then hopefully we'll have some time to dig into some uh, development things. Uh, some feedback on ideas that Bobby has to improve our GitHub process. Um, and then if anybody else has anything they want to talk about, um, we'll open it up at the end. Okay, so quick introduction. Um, so I'm Jason Lopower. Uh, I'm a professor here at uh, UC Davis. Um, and I am the chair of the project management committee of Jimba. So the PMC is the project management committee. Um, Officially, the project management committee is here to just kind of oversee the administration of the project, uh, make sure the project continues moving forward. Um, in also as part of the community are the maintainers of Gym 5, of which many members of the PMC are maintainers, although not all maintainers are members of the PMC. So there's some overlap there. Um, currently, other members of the PMC are like uh, you know Steve Reinhardt and David Wood, who have been with the project for 20 plus years, although they don't do any development uh, day to day anymore. So maintainers, um, this is an official group on GitHub, 
And these are the people who have permission to merge things into the repo. And they also have the expectation of providing quick or reasonably quick feedback on um, uh, pull requests and issues. Then there's the Gym 5 developers, which is you all, which is what this meeting is, is about uh, geared towards Gym 5 developers, although everyone is welcome. Um, all maintainers should be developers, although some of us, like me, don't get to develop as much as I would really like to. Um, but I do look at code um, often, and I, so I think all maintainers um, are developers. And then there's the users, of which I think many of our developers are also users. Um, and this kind of makes up the Gym 5 uh, community. Um, so as I said, everyone is welcome at this meeting, um, but it's really geared towards um, these uh, developers. Okay, cool. Um, so a couple of quick introductions. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say here. Um, so I think you all will have realized that a lot of this work, a lot of the names that you see are coming out of UC Davis. And I just kind of wanted to make it clear that here at Davis, we are a combination of, you know, I, I am on the PMC. We have a couple of maintainers here at Davis. We have a number of developers of Gym 5 at Davis and a lot of uh, users um, in our research group. So here at UC Davis, we kind of um, run this span. And um, my goal here is to uh, kind of drive the community forward um, and make sure that the community is getting the resources that it needs. So speaking of resources, we have a couple of new um, additions to our community um, in the past uh, three or four months. So Ivana Mitrovic, who is, you can see on video here, and Harshal Patel. Um, these are both um, programmers who are being paid to work on Gym 5. And so they're here and their only job is to support the Gym 5 community, um, either through writing code, doing code reviews, and just general support uh, for the community. Um, Bobby is also in a similar role, and we just, um, many of you might have, might recognize uh, Melissa Jost, who unfortunately for us, but fortunately for her, went on to uh, bigger and better things um, in the past month. Okay, so um, the current status of the project. So we migrated to GitHub in July or June, um, and since this, I think the velocity of the project has increased significantly. So for instance, we are getting, you know, about one issue a day that is created. And unfortunately we can't quite close things that quickly. So currently we have 30 issues open. Um, in the last couple of months, pull requests, we're getting three or more pull requests every day. Um, we're able to merge one to two pull requests a day, um, but this still means that there are more pull requests open than closed. Um, unfortunately, you can't see the clones for some reason because I guess I pasted the image on the wrong slide, um, but you can kind of see here what the GitHub data is, uh, which by the way, I kind of scraped from GitHub every week or so um, and put into this. So GitHub gives us the number of clones and unique clones. I'm not totally sure what these uh, mean and GitHub doesn't really say what they mean. Um, but I think we can see that there are a lot of users of Gym5 if we're getting many thousand clones per month. Okay, so I'm gonna take a minute and talk about the new GitHub workflow. Um, oh, sorry, I'm talking a lot. Uh, so the new GitHub workflow, um, Generally, our goal is to migrate everything we can to GitHub. We have found over the past few months that putting everything in one place is making things a lot easier. Um, so a couple of uh, suggestions for the community. Um, please put your real name in GitHub. Um, this makes it much easier to use the at in GitHub. So if you don't have your real name and I try to at you based on your real name, GitHub just doesn't find you. And I know a lot of people's names. Remembering both names and handles is a lot for me. Um, also, use your real email, not the GitHub anonymous email, um, so we can 
uh, keep track of uh, the committers um, to the project. As a quick reminder, create your pull request on the develop branch. Um, unfortunately, we have not found a way in GitHub to make this the default, since stable is what we want our users to check out. Um, so just remember that PRs have to be switched over to develop. Um, and then currently what's going on once you create a PR, um, in order to merge it, you have to pass the CI tests, which are automatically run if your PR is not a draft PR, unless you're a first time contributor, in which case one of the maintainers needs to go in and approve it. Um, but I think that that has happened within hours um, in all cases so far. But if that doesn't happen, feel free to bug um, any of us um, that you see here. Um, by the way, when these tests run, they are running on machines that we own either here at UC Davis or at University of Wisconsin. Um, we have not had any issues with these becoming overloaded, but I just wanted to let the community know um, that those are running on our infrastructure, not on GitHub's infrastructure. Um, and then once you're, the test pass and you receive an approval from a maintainer, then a maintainer can merge um, your change. Uh, if you want us to receive emails of everything that's going on, um, you can use the watch button in GitHub and you can configure some of these, although not particularly well. Annoyingly, there are many repos that we use. So Gem5 is where the main Gem5 development is, um, but we also have a website repo, a repo for um, the source for all the Gem5 resources, as well as a repo for the website for Gem5 resources, um, and probably one or two that I've forgotten. So if you wanna see everything that's going on, you have to watch all those individually, um, which is a bit of a pain point. And just so you know kind of what's going on behind the scenes, our goal here at Davis is to do our best to move changes from uh, pull request into merge and move issues from created to closed. And to give you an idea again, what's going on behind the scenes, we have these big project boards in GitHub that we're tracking every single issue and every single pull request across the project. And we kind of track what the status is. And so if you ever get a, you know, but ping from us being like, why hasn't this been updated? Or, you know, do we need to do something on this? This is us trying to track these things um, through time to make sure that they move into the done state. Right now, these projects are um, private, mostly because we didn't think anybody cares. Um, but if people are interested to follow these things, we could open these up um, and make them public. So if you're super interested, bug us. Um, and we will open these up. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of the new GitHub workflow. Um, I'm gonna pause here for a minute and see if anybody has questions or maybe if any of the other maintainers have comments on this. Okay, we have a quiet group. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so continuing on about the GitHub workflow, um, there's some things that are really working really well. But generally, I think it's going really well. I think that this has been a huge uh, improvement over our Garrett workflow from before. So things that are working well, we're getting great reviews and the reviews are coming in quickly. Um, I think we're doing a much better job now of keeping up with reviews. Um, and in fact, this is the code velocity is, to be honest, daunting <laughs> from a maintainer's point of view, getting multiple merges per day. Um, these merges are a ton of work and it's a ton of work from the community, um, which we all really appreciate. Uh, and the, looking, the, the testing infrastructure, our move from uh, using the internal infrastructure at Google on Kokoro to using uh, GitHub Actions and running things locally at Wisconsin and Davis has um, been a little bumpy, but is working surprisingly well. It's totally being able to keep up. Some places that we can improve. So one thing, there was a discussion about merging versus rebasing versus squashing. I think we probably made the wrong decision at the beginning. 
backpedaled a little bit, maybe into another wrong decision. But I think we finally come down on something that works where we have um, prefer merge unless it's a single um, commit and then use squashing. But if you have more opinions on this, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, testing, as I said, is, well, testing is always a pain point in all projects. Um, and currently it's quite time consuming um, for us as maintainers, but it's getting better. Another thing that I would like to put in the mind of all the developers is that today the costs are reasonable for testing. As we add more tests, which we always want to do, we're going to have to start thinking about the cost of testing and whether we need to buy more machines for testing and how we're going to do that. Another test thing, which is quite a pain point in GitHub is when post commit tests fail. Um, when post commit tests fail, so these are tests we have, not only do we have the CI tests that, pat, that run before commits are actually merged, but then we also have another three set of tests, the daily tests that run every day, the compiler tests that run once a week, and the weekly tests that uh, run once a week as well. Weekly is the name. Um, those happen after, after something is committed. And so if a commit breaks one of those tests, it becomes difficult to jump into action and get that fixed. And a lot of that uh, responsibility falls on mostly the maintainers here at Davis. Um, so that's a pain point. Um, Bobby, did you want to talk about this now or do you want to talk about this later? I forget, to be honest. Uh, I, I was going to let you uh, tell me when to talk about it. I can talk about it now. It seems like a good time. Yeah, go so, ahead. Yeah, because uh, yeah, as Jason said, the post commit test. So uh, for those of you a bit more familiar with the test, that's the uh, the daily tests, the ones that run well every night California time and the weekly tests and the compiler tests, which also run on a weekly basis. Uh, I think the two uh, the the two pain points here are, first of all, uh, as Jason mentioned before, the GitHub notification infrastructure isn't great. And I even I don't get notified of these failures, I think, quickly enough, or I've not got the right setting. I haven't quite figured that out yet. And the second point is, uh, which is just, we had this problem in Jenkins at the time all time, is, okay, the daily tests fail, but people are still pushing PRs. And actually we can get into a situation where, you know, I fix the original bug, we move forward, but it's actually, there's another bug being, being like introduced and it's kind of all kind of compounds together and becomes more of a mess to actually figure out. So what I'm going to, this is, uh, I, I, in a sense, I almost suspect to be controversial, but I can't reason out why, is uh, today I'm going to implement that PRs will be blocked from merging until the daily, weekly, and compiler tests are all passing. So this essentially, and right now, I don't think any of these are passing. So PRs will be blocked until we can find time to iron these out. Um, and you know the reason for this is when, uh, let's say dailies, uh, when the dailies fail, we can freeze, we can see what's been uh, pushed into the code base. So since the last time the dailies ran, we can but we can bisect it, we can figure out, we can fix it, and then once we fix the repo and the tests are passing, uh, you can commit your changes to actually working code base. Uh, uh, just to FI, of course, how do you get code into the code base if we block PRs? Uh, I maintainers do have a special button to force through a PR without any status checks or actually anything in, at all. Uh, so that's how we would actually. Put the pit, uh, put, do the fixes to the code base. Uh, I realize this might be kind of frustrating when you've got a PR that's all ready to go and all the tests, all the CI tests have passed. But I think this kind of fulfills our two goals of one, people are instantly notified there's a failure, but suddenly they'll realize that none of the PRs are mergeable and there'll be a big thing that says PR not mergeable because daily test failing. Uh, and it stops this compound, obviously stops this compounding issue where people trying to fix, uh, I always feel like with the daily test, we're trying to fix moving targets sometimes. Uh, the code base is continually changing and actually I'm not fixing the right thing or thing, or there's multiple bugs that have coincided to cause that failure. So uh, I'm going to enable that later today. And uh, this is an experiment. Let's see how it goes. It's literally from once I've 
done it. It's a on off switch. I can turn it off at any point if it turns out to be a disaster. So this isn't something I think we need to worry too much about, uh, but let's see how it goes. Should I allow, open the floor to anyone who wants to talk about this? If anyone has any thoughts, this is a good time, I guess. Yeah, I guess quickly, does anybody have any um, major reason why we should not do this? Which So does anyone think we should not disable merges when the daily, weekly, or compiled tests are failing? Apologies for the double negative. Okay. Uh, doesn't seem there's any okay. protest there. That's Less great. controversial than I thought. I, it I, yeah, I, I, often, <laughs> I often find, I think, I often go through this thing where I think things are going to be controversial. I state it publicly. No one says anything. I think, oh, it's no. And then I do it. And that's when the controversy starts, when people actually see it. So, yeah. uh, but hopefully, yes, this goes through okay um yeah and uh by the way just to uh i think i think goes out saying this is a community open source massive collaborative project uh i i know i'm paid to work full time on gem 5 so i guess i am the most obvious person to fix and buy side bugs but these bug reports are public you can go to the action and see what the failure actually is and download the logs if you, please feel free to put bug fixes especially for stuff you think you might have accidentally broke uh yeah, that would be great. But, you know, uh, I will also take care of it if no one else does. Oh, cool. thanks, Bobby. Um, okay, and the last pain point with GitHub, um, this last one, is that it's kind of difficult to follow updates. Um, again, we're running at a really high velocity now. So trying to keep track of all the changes going into Gym 5 is very difficult. Um, and then it's spread out across a bunch of repos. And so tracking all these things, again, it's easy to miss. Um, so all these things are, you know, kind of pain points that I've noticed. I don't have solid, um, well, except for Bobby's suggestion on the post commit test failures here. Um, I don't have solid proposals for fixing it. So if you have ideas, as Bobby said, this is um, a community project. So I'm hoping the community can kind of step in and help us uh, smooth out some of these pain points. Or if you have ideas. We can try to implement. Let's see. Tom asks, uh, "Does the um, merge blocked, the merge request blocked, get the failure, or only the first merge request that breaks will get notified?" So uh, you should, as far as I understand it, uh, when you go to your PR and see that it's blocked on, say, a daily test failure, you can click on the little details, and you'll go to that daily test uh, action, and it'll say what the you know it'll give the status, you know, tell you you should be able to see from that screen what has failed. And everyone who's blocked should be able to see that. That is my expectation when I enable this. And as far as I understand it, that's how it will work. I think all pull requests will get the failure. They'll get they'll they'll have all pull requests will have a link to the failure. Yes. Rakama, did you want to um yeah I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. So it it makes sense to me. Um, I was wondering, um, let's say that there is like a daily test which is failing. So of course there are like a multiple potential culprits, uh, different pull requests. And let's say that um, you manage to isolate, which is like the pull request uh, that actually breaks things in time, um, but actually fixing the problem could be actually complicated. So to basically prevent other pull requests, pending pull requests for basically just starving, could you just enable like a policy that if the issue is actually complicated and you don't have actually resources, or we don't have resources to actually see, to fix it in a reasonable amount of time, we can actually temporarily revert the pull request and basically uh, unblock merging. I, I think that's a, I, I wouldn't even say that. I think that's a perfectly sensible uh, policy I don't want things sitting uh, in this state for days and days and days. Uh, I completely agree as like a, I'm not even sure you call it a policy, just uh, sensible that we maybe revert a PR that would be a bigger fix to do. Uh, I'm totally fine with that. Cool, thanks. Yep. Uh, okay, cool. So let's uh, moving on. Uh, so development updates. Um, so first, 
uh, I want to give out a couple of stars um, before I dive into details of the developer updates. Um, so there's a couple of people I want to call out. Um, I know Fa is on the call. I'm not sure if Nicholas is on the call, unfortunately. But um, there's a couple of uh, people I want to call out here. So uh, Nicholas Moiser, um, who according to his GitHub as a PhD student at Stanford, um, has been doing some incredibly impressive detailed bug reports um, and then fixing things with pull requests, which has been really um, impactful. And so he has had many fixes to the x86 KVM and I believe in syscall emulation mode, but generally x86 KVM is making much more robust. And then uh, Juan Nguyen, who's a student here at Davis, um, he tracked down and fixed a RISC-V floating point bug that has been plaguing us for at least six, maybe nine months of like, we would run a floating point application and just get the wrong answer. And this was very difficult to track down and Juan did a really good job tracking it down and then fixing it. So I just wanted to call out these two people. Um, I'll try to do this every month to see the things that really um, stand out as really awesome contributions. Okay, so uh, some development updates and I'm gonna call on people here. I hope you're prepared. Um, so there's been a bunch of ARM improvements. Uh, Giacomo or Andreas, do you wanna talk some about what's been going on in the ARM development side? Document. All right. Yeah, I was waiting, uh, Andres, for you. Uh, yeah, uh, we actually added uh, some support, some some uh, particular uh, ARM B eight point X extension, if I recall correctly. Um, above my head, uh, uh, TLBI range uh, to basically support um, range invalidation, address range invalidation uh, for the TLB, and then uh, the other one where TCR two and um, uh, which was the other one, SCTLR2 is basically new extended registers to the um, ARM architecture. I'm not sure if I'm missing something, but those are the, those were the main ones, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I just grabbed some random PRs. I'm not sure if those were the right PRs to mm -hmm. grab either. Uh, cool. Um, is there anything else that's coming down the pipe um, over the next little while that we should be prepared for? So I think this is on probably on your next slide, but we have been supporting David Shaw in his uh, with his FDIP front end and his branch predictor stuff. Um, so we're currently spending some time just running performance regressions and those sort of things. Cool, thanks. Um, do you know if there are any updates to Chai coming down? I know I've talked to. And and maybe maybe we need to enable let's see is Tiago here. Um so I'm gonna allow you to talk, Tiago. Um you know, we've I've been talking to some people kind of through different uh channels on um prefetch support for Chai or other changes in Chai. Yeah, yeah, uh yeah. So yeah, we have an internal version of Gen 5 that has a adapter that allows you to plug the Prefetchers that we have right now for the classic caches, you can plug those into uh into our uh, Ruby slash CHI model. Uh, I'm working on a few fixes and refactoring, uh, but planning to upstream that. Uh, yeah, hopefully by the end of this month, uh, make the pull request so you guys can can have a look and see. Uh, how we can move forward. I had to do some refactoring on the on the uh, classic caches to isolate like the interface that the prefetchers used. So you can use that for both classic caches and also uh, Ruby cache controllers. Uh, so that there might be some, yeah, we might, we might need to do some iterations on that, but I plan to push everything by the end of the month. Cool, thanks. Thanks for that update. Um, anything else from the ARM side that's uh, big coming down the pipe? Or small? Uh, maybe not related to ARM specifically, but uh, um, I guess uh, we're about to sort of upstream um, an integration with the Capstone uh, disassembler, I believe. 
um, basically like a third party library for disassembling instructions. Um, we know that uh, Gem5 has some flaws in the disassembly process and people when I implemented the architectural instructions, they were not really maybe careful sometimes and on basically providing the right assemble. And so there is like a divergence on what's to be, what should be the architectural uh, string, let's say. Uh, and I think, guess with the disassembler, we have like a more exact, probably a more exact trace. And I guess we can also use it to basically fix our own bugs. And that could potentially run with every tracer. It's basically an addition to the tracer interface. So you can have a, you can basically plug it to every tracer. Of course, like then the tracer uh, needs to actually reference it, but uh, it's supposed to be extensible and it's supposed to be reusable by, by different tracers. So for example, um, I plugged it to the exact tracer, which is the default one we use for CPU tracing. Um, but uh, we also use it in another um, ARM tracer, which is a tarmac tracer. Cool. Um, okay, so moving on, um, there's been a lot of improvements as well to the AMD GPU, um, including better support for full system mode. Um, there's currently ongoing work on trying to get a standard library board for the AMD GPU. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff that's currently, or testing for the AMD GPUs in the to-do list. Um, Matt was here a minute ago. Did Matt have to drop off? Uh, depending on which Matt you mean, I'm still oh, here. He, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, you, you, your picture disappeared. Um, okay. Could you talk a little bit about what's uh, the what's been going on and what's coming? Sure. Uh, so I work primarily on the full system support. So, I'll, but I don't think Matt Sinclair can make it, who works primarily on system emulation mode. But I'll try to cover him as well. Uh, in terms of full system, since the last release, um, there's been a, five bug fixes that fix some hangs and page faults that we're seeing in the previous version. Um, and then in terms of new features, um, we enabled AVX in the config, which allows you to run Rock Blast and bumped the Rock conversion to 5.4.2, which is the most recent version that supports both PyTorch and TensorFlow. So that's the reason we picked that one. Um, also enabled PCI Atomics. So it just tells the simulator that PCI Atomics are supported, which allows for host call kernels to be run. Uh, these are pretty widely used again in these ML frameworks. Um, there's implementation of scratch and instructions and timestamps. So the hip events will now return non-zero values. Not that I would trust uh, the simulated timestamp value, you know, in general, um, but that's what's been going on full system that's listed here. Um, the to-do PRs I just looked up are related to testing. So there's not a lot of testing at full system at the moment, uh, but there is a code review open for a disk image uh, creation script using Packer. And hopefully that can be used to add some kind of full system test in the near future. Um, going forward to next release, as I've been alluding to, we're trying to get some kind of ML framework working by uh, 23.1. Um, we have something working sort of internally, but there's a, a few more things upcoming. And it also relies on some of these outstanding atomic patches from Matt's student, Dan, uh, to work. And then on the system emulation side, so again, I'm trying to cover what Matt Sinclair has been working on and his students. Uh, so I think the most promising thing towards the next release is support for checkpointing in between kernels. So the idea is that we can potentially fast forward through some kernels, maybe even using the KVM CPU and create a checkpoint. And then you'd be able to restore from there and simulate you know, kernel 10,000 in a, in a GPU application without having to wait for the other 9,999. Um, that's what I had on my list of updates since last release. Um, let me know if I missed anything, Jason. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, I think one of the big things as far as like syncing up here in a development meeting is these testing is really difficult for us to support because we here at Davis don't fully understand how to use the GPU. We don't have a lot of experience using it. Um, and it the tests that we were running before were not in the same style as all the other Gym 5 tests. So, it, 
Matt's not here, unfortunately, and I don't see his students. But um, yeah, th this is something we need help with. Um, yeah, on the maintainer side. So on the full system side, it shouldn't be any different than running any other full system um, test. I, I know the system emulation mode has some other Docker images that are required, so I'm not too familiar with that either. But um, yeah, from my understanding yeah. of the GPU and this uh, testing is, I think we do put all GPUs in one bucket here, but uh, it's the SE mode that requires a very, very specific environment that um, our current testing infrastructure isn't very good at doing automatically. So that's a series of scripts, basically, that wrap in Docker containers. Uh, I think we should just move the GPU FS tests to kind of be, be, be where everything else is. That's the basic test you run via main.py in the test directory. Uh, I call them test lib because that's the library that it uses. Uh, but yes, I think the SE mode is going to continually to be a little funny set of tests that are always going to run a bit separately. Okay, cool. Um, and then real quick, I don't see, is there anybody from Barcelona on the call? Could you raise your hand? I have to admit, I'm not super familiar with everyone's names or their shortened names. I don't see anybody raising their hands. Um, so the people at Barcelona Supercomputing, um, as well as a few other places, have been working really hard on uh, RVV support on RISC-V vector extensions. Um, currently, I believe, the status is that RISC-V vector extensions should work with all of our tithing CPUs. Um, this was not the case a few, at least a month ago. Um, and there's more changes coming through to make configurable VLAN and other improvements. Um, what's missing, the biggest thing that's missing here, similar to the AMD GPU stuff, is support and Gen 5 resources, um, which we are also working on here at Davis. Um, so then the other two things that's going on, I'm going to do the quick one first. Um, so FYI, the second one, uh, Gen 5's build system is changing. There's a pull request to use kconfig on top of scans. So instead of building Gem5 um, in a way that was very implicit with using some special um, name like build x86 Gem5 or build ARM Gem5, um, uh, Gabe Black and then uh, uh, Yushin at Google has been uh, working on this kconfig stuff. Um, so FYI, these are two changes that are going to be merged soon. If you have any comments on these, um, get your comments in now, because they'll probably be merged um, within the next week or so. And then uh, the other one that I wanted to have a quick conversation about, um, and I think Argov is here. Um, and let's see, do we have... Uh, David, yes, great. Yes. Um, so Bargov and David um, have been working on fetch direct to prefetching uh, support for Gen5, which is great. Very excited about this. This is something Gen5 has needed for a long time. Um, and it was great that two PRs came in at the same time. So I guess I have two questions for y'all. Um, one is an open-ended question that we probably won't be able to answer right now, which is, how do we get these two changes in? And my other question is, what can we here at Davis or others on the, um, or other maintainers do to support you and help you get these pull requests merged? So I think, yeah, I can answer that. I can go to the second one first because uh, it's like, so far I've been only testing with X8, I started out with ARM branch and, and eventually uh, I added x86 support as well. But uh, I think uh, I, I've only tested with very few workloads so far. So the idea was that like, I will take the Gempy without an unmodified Gempy and then make sure that when I modify, I want to see better performance than unmodified version. 
and so far i was able to test with uh, verilator cassandra and tpcc i mean the reason being why i could not test is that i had a tool before which is basically checkpointing using a real on, on a, a chemo based system and then porting it to jumpy for arm so now i cannot use it because i was using on like 2 year old uh, jumpy repo so i need to port the other tool first to be able to test uh, arm workloads but it will be great if you have um, arm set up like any workloads to be uh, testing out uh, these features and yeah i think uh, because and also uh, i was also looking at both patches that we have so far and um, i mean yeah honestly i, li I like the uh, i like david shaw's uh, implementation it's very clean in terms of the way uh, it's written but i think it also required changes to branch vector and things like uh, which i don't ha i haven't pushed yet because there are some uh, fixes that need to be done on the branch vector side uh, which basically if you go down aggressively in the wrong path and um, branch vector state is not completely recovered back if you flush everything and the state remains uh, like corrupted which i have internally fixed but it's like they have very like bunch of many hacky changes so it will be very hard to review as well so i want to clean them up first before uh, pushing them up but that also depends on how these things are going to be integrated right so i'm waiting uh, is like there are like bunch of changes going on and um, i'm waiting for the first review to come back to see how people feel about the current set of patches and then moving forward i will work on the rest of the things makes sense so what about your perspective david um yes so i um so i also had to look at um the other patches and uh i think um i definitely can integrate some ideas uh because um yeah we i think as as the prs are at the moment i think both are not ready to really merge but i think from both of us it was not the intention it was just to also get some feedback to improve it because I have the feeling that it will change quite a bit. And as Bavak uh, says, is um, it requires quite a lot of changes also to the branch predictor and we should make sure it's correct um, and we should not break anything. Um, so I'm currently also working with Andreas to um, in a more um, um yeah on smaller patches to split the work get a better review um, so i i yeah. should probably mention that uh david cook uh, richard cook is, is spending quite a lot of time on this as well he is helping out with the performance regression so it's not just me yeah 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 true, true. sorry yeah um yeah and i think one thing which my Patches lack like, is definitely some testing, uh, some tests. And I think if we add tests, uh, I think if we merge something about FDIP in either of these uh, cases, we definitely need, need test cases. What kind um, of tests do you all want? That's something we can help with. I mean, it's. I, let, let me ask a different way. How small can these tests be? Or do we need to run full spec applications? So what we're doing internally for the branch predictor changes that David is working on is that we're running uh, specs and points and using that as a sort of performance regression suite. And we'll probably do that for the full FDIP change as well and look at the performance uplift. That's probably not what we want to do for uh, regressions once this has been merged though. Well, but what one thing we can do, and, and this is somewhat what we're wanting to do. Um, so ignoring the legal issues of spec for a minute, like we have a bunch of spec endpoints that are in Gem5 resources format and are set up in these suites, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, um, that like requires one button push to get all these to run in parallel. Um, in a way that's reproducible in the standard library. So that's something that we can work to try to get public so that everyone at least is using the exact same uh, sim points and the same workloads. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I want, uh, the only thing with spec, it's um, 
it's not server workloads and usually FTIP is for servers because it's uh, because if the um, instruction working set fits into the L1 cache, then you don't get much benefit of the of the FTIP implementation. And I think if we have a benchmark which really needs the prefetching, that would be good to see also the performance gains. Yeah. Um, I yeah I have some thoughts there. Like I mean, as uh, Dave pointed out, that's exactly true. If workload fits in I cache, there is no point doing FTIP because you have already have things in I cache. But I see there are some workloads in uh, Spec as well, like GCC, where uh, mm -hmm. they still uh, benefit. So yeah, something like a workload which whose uh, footprint size are larger than L2 would would do uh, would help. And other thing would be higher branch misprediction rates. Um, so that's where uh, we could. I mean, yeah, we don't know if if you have very high branch misprediction rates, you cannot always say that it helps. It depends on what kind of branches are those and how much. Uh, so uh, prediction benefit you're getting. So as an action item, what I'm going to do is we'll create an issue on GitHub around getting some public workloads for this so that we're all using the same thing for testing. Um, and I'll ping you all on ideas for what workloads we should focus on. So I would suggest that we make this a bit more general because it's not just the, the couple front end. It's, it's really just performance regressions in general. Uh, which is something, I mean, this is something we realized when we started to review the the branch predictor fixes that we, we don't really have any good way of tracking uh, performance changes from like between commits. Yep, great. We will um, create an issue on that too. That subsumes this. Yeah, these are really good points. Also maybe um, it would be good also to follow the simulation time because um, Yes, depending on how you implement it, it could slow down simulation quite a lot. So that, and that would be bad for, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, any other quick things? I wanna make sure we get to everything and at least have a few minutes at the end for discussion. Okay, cool. Thanks y'all. Um, so let's, uh, m maybe we should have a discussion or an issue. Is, is there a discussion, GitHub discussion created for this? No, okay. We will create a GitHub discussion so we can all have one place and kind of keep up to date with what's going on. And if, um, by the way, if, if we ever need to sync synchronously like this on Zoom, um, let me know when I can set something up. Okay. Cool, thanks y'all. Um, this is gonna be really impactful when it gets in. So everything that we can do to support you, we want to do. Thanks. Um, okay. Thank you. So we only have eight minutes left. Um, real quick, other discussions. Um, uh, so I'm going to try to blow through these. Um, so Bobby pushed a bunch of changes to update pre commit, which looks like they've been reviewed. Um, so if anybody has comments on those changes, please take a look. So this is adding things like automatic sorting for Python inputs, um, running other um, linters automatically, um, that's changing some form code formatting things, um, and a few others. So take a look at those, search pre-commit on um, GitHub uh, if you want to uh, get your opinion known. There's a claim format change, which has been on and off again for years now. Does anyone have a reason not to just run, like pick something and do it? Is there anything that is going to slow down getting this change in? So isn't the change on GitHub already pretty good? I, as far as I can tell, it's, it's not very intrusive. It mostly follows the current style guide. Um, to me, it seems like we should just merge that one maybe with some minor modifications i think the main thing is just uh basically engineers being engineers every single time we feel we're close someone jumps in and says oh can we fiddle this around a little bit but i think so much people just pull the trigger and merge it oh, I, <laughs> i'm giving you all an, a, a a chance right now to say i want to fiddle around with this and if nobody says i want to fiddle around with this 
I, I, I would also like to say on this particular change, uh, I'm a lot more comfortable with, I mean, apart from maybe ver uh, variable naming and class naming and things, uh, I want the what's defined this client format to be our style guide and maybe not like the other way around because I find that a lot more easy to manage. Like, oh, if client format says this is uh, correct or formats to this, then that is the correct way to do it. It just makes things a lot more automated and less nuanced in our guides. Uh, Wasn't that pretty much the consensus on the product? Yeah, process? yeah. I, I guess I'm just more saying, yeah, that no one seemed to disagree with me on that. I'm just kind of saying it in more public form or in this meeting, yeah. We're giving people a chance to object. Because we did it with black, and I really actually love black. Black is like my favorite thing ever about Python. Uh, so uh, I kind of want to do the same thing with Clang uh, to an extent, or with the Clang let's format. Let's just go for it. Yeah, okay, let's go. Cool. We'll do it this week then. That's that's getting in. So uh, I think my, my only comment on that pull request, which is already on the pull request, is that we mm -hmm. should um, avoid changing the um, uh, the bit unions, and I think that's possible. Yeah, I think that's important. Cool. Um, so I'm not going to, okay. Removing change ID. Can we drop this change ID requirement? I think the general consensus is yes. Some people want an ID that you can use to track, uh, changes through time. I can add something else that's, you know, it's not a requirement, but might be added. Uh, I think everyone's happy. I just want to make sure it doesn't break things for Garrett people. People who use Garrett seem to be fine with this. Uh, I don't think there's much of an issue. I just need to go forward with it. But if you have anything to say, put it on the discussions page. Uh, I'll respond and get back to you. Uh, can I ask you, maybe I missed some parts, like sure. what's the motivation for removing uh, change IDs? It's just, um, first of all, it's kind of a bit of an overhead to, uh, inf well, no, I suppose not removing them, removing them as a requirement for a commit. Because we we currently require it as it in like commits to GitHub, and that has caused a few problems. That actually is kind of I think it's actually made things worse for people who use Garrett because you've got ch cases where there's multiple change IDs per commit, and lots of commits don't have change IDs, so it's a bit uh, not really worked out as we intended. Uh, not removing them, just not having them as a requirement in for pull requests. But that should already be like easy to. We already have like uh, different requirements with per commit. Oh so... yeah, it, it, I'll, I'll, okay. When we first moved to GitHub, there was people who came up to me and said, "You've got to require change ID still," and because we want this to work with our Garrett systems, I went along with this. On second guess, I should have challenged this a bit more because I don't think this was ever really a requirement for people who use Garrett. I think maybe a bit of confusion with how these systems would interact. So I'm just saying, hey, is it okay if I drop this? I think the consensus is yes, but uh, so, yeah. Because we, we we have a check when you make a PR, check to see that every single commit you've submitted has a change ID. Gar I, I mean, GitHub doesn't need that, but we have a check. Um, we actually use internally with Garrett for maintenance. Uh, we basically use the change ID to actually tag and- Yeah, uh, you, we you have like can- Internal well, brand, I, yeah. You can let's, still let's, sorry, let's try to focus this discussion. Yeah. You, so you, you, three so minutes left. you can still use, you can still submit patches to GitHub that have change IDs. You just don't have to. And if you want to use change IDs in your own internal systems, that's fine. Uh, and I believe you can still merge in the uh, GitHub based yeah. repo into your Garrett based repo and won't, won't cause any problems. No, but sorry, sorry, Bobby, to interrupt, but because there is a little time uh, that I understand and eventually could be fine. The problem is that we don't just want to maintain our own patches that we push. We also maintain patches that other people push that don't have the change so, ID. Giacomo, are you saying that it's a requirement for you that every single commit in Gym 5 has a change ID? Uh, yes, or no? It will be better, let me put it this way. It will make things easier. And I don't think, I don't really see Concretely, what's the so word? The, the downside is that new contributors to Gem5 do not have these um, scripts installed. And almost every new contributor to Gem5 runs into the problem of their change cannot be merged because it doesn't have a change ID. This is a mm -hmm. headache for but people. And there is a minority of the community that needs this. So 
it's, yeah. There's a trade-off between the making things easier for you and maybe Matt Paremba versus making everything harder for the general community. So I, I think what we really need is a way to track logical changes. And that's how we use change IDs today. So the maintainer tools in Gen 5, which we use internally, they are based on change IDs. Now, I think we could probably use the PR ID instead. Uh, and pull requests kind of have the same function in, in that they identify logical changes. So I, I, my, my, I'll say this in just a few sentences. Uh, my idea was that maybe we can have a job when you submit a PR, when, sorry, when you merge a PR, it automatically amends to the commit messages in that PR, a link to the pull request that, uh, that course, but there's problems with that, there's problems. And I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that okay. for time round. So I, 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 I got to cut this off because we're at the hour. Yeah. This sounds like we need more discussion here. So Giacomo and others who need change ID, please respond to this discussion 324. Um, we're not going to talk about removing tags and um, we're not going to talk about merge queues. Um, finally, uh, next month, I just want to quickly uh, look out. Um, so one thing, I'm going to do less broadcasting next month. We're going to have more discussions. Um, one thing I want to discuss is we're going to give Bobby 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, to talk about how to develop and contribute to the standard library, because this is something that has changed over the past year or so that we really want um, more of the community working towards. Um, we're also going to discuss some improvements on Gen 5 resources with suites and multiprocessing. Um, and then we need to be thinking about when we want to do the Gen 5 23.1 release. And I'm sorry that I didn't leave any time for other discussions, um, but please ping me uh, either on GitHub or via email. Um, you can find my email by Googling my name. Um, if there's anything you want to discuss uh, for next time. And it's going to be on the second Thursday of the month going forward. Okay, so thank you all so much uh, for joining. Um, and also give me feedback if you think this was useful or useless or a waste of time or some something that we can do to improve. I'd love to improve this going forward. You can probably uh, make a comment on the discussions page in GitHub if you want to give some feedback on this. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate everybody who joined. Um, and next time we will have more time for discussion, I promise. Thank you, everybody.